I now am delighted <laughs> to introduce Charlie Rose, host of the nightly PBS show that engages thinkers, writers, politicians, athletes, entertainers, business leaders, scientists, and others, newsmakers. We've been honored to have Charlie bring his show to the Harvard Business School a few times in recent years, but never more honored than we are today. In a world of mostly soundbite journalism, Charlie Rose stands alone in having intelligent, deep conversations with the world's most interesting and most important people. We've asked Charlie to do exactly that today with these five of our most distinguished alumni at a pivotal, pivotal time in this world's history. Please join in welcome, welcoming and thanking Charlie Rose for being with us today. Um, uh, here's a couple of things. First of all, I'm deeply honored to be here at this business school where I do come and, and do uh, interviews from the business school talking about one of the subjects we want to talk about today, which is leadership. Uh, and management. Uh, it is never uh, more appropriate. I just looked at the papers that arrived at my hotel uh, early this morning. Congress urges swift bank rescue. Markets see hope in rescue. Europe raises stakes in bank bailout rescue. I mean, it's clearly uh, a subject that everybody is thinking about and talking about it. We want to put it in the context uh, of leadership uh, in terms of decision making. And we want to take advantage of such a distinguished group uh, to reflect on how they see it, a snapshot in time, but also looking at the future. Uh, I glanced this morning at the mission of the Harvard Business School and, quote, it is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. And that is exactly uh, what we want to do, to talk about leadership, talk about leaders, talk about making a difference in the world. And so what I would like to begin with uh, in going from uh, down the line of these distinguished people, how they see the crisis we are in, you know, and, and it exactly what it is that they think um, they would like to see happen and must happen to sort of regain the confidence of the world uh, in terms of not only financial markets, but people's belief that their own security, their economic security, uh, is safe. I begin with Meg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think, you know, this is an unprecedented um, challenge to the financial system around the globe as we know it. I think there's probably not a soul in this room who would have predicted what had happened over the last three to four weeks, um, that it would happen at this time, with this magnitude, with this global impact. And I think there's a couple of things that need to be done. First of all, people need to be enfranchised into the solutions. Um, I think a better job needs to be done explaining to the American people and the people of other industrialized nations about what caused this, how we found ourselves in this situation, and how we're going to get ourselves out of it. And I think coming back to the point of this um, conference, which is leadership, I think um, leaders around the globe need to stand up, tell the truth, but also inspire confidence that we will work our way out of this. And I think we've begun to see some of that. I think the, the G7 this weekend in Washington, D.C. was helpful in that regard. But this is an unprecedented challenge to the economic system as we see it. And I think most American consumers, and I see the consumer every single day at eBay, most American consumers are deeply afraid. They're seeing the value of their 401k go down, the value of their house go down, the price of food go up, the price of gas filling up your tank is now a luxury. And they're scared and they need to understand the root causes, they need to understand the plan of action, and they need to have confidence that we will work ourselves out of this. Do you think they have seen that so far in terms of the way this has been handled? I think we can do a better job in that regard across the board. I think there have been um, glimmers of confidence and glimmers of inspiration. I think we need more um, explanation and we m need more leadership across the board. As we do this, and I'm, uh, each of you as we go down for this sort of opening line of, of look, taking a snapshot, feel free to sort of reflect on where you see it from your own perspective, you know, whether it's Anand is the only person who hasn't been on my show, by the way. Uh, 
An omission I hope to correct very soon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking as I walked out here, uh, this is, if you do what I do, a dream. First of all, an enthusiastic audience. Secondly, people who know what they're talking about. Uh, we could do a week of program and I could go home or I could go watch the Red Sox play and whatever else you might want to do uh, for the rest of the week. So having said that, Anand, how do you see this from the perspective of, of India and your own global concerns? So first of all, Charlie, let me say you really intimidated me now because if after this you don't ask me on your show, it means I did a terrible job. <laughs> but, using the metaphor of the time, hit a home run, everything will be okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in your first question of how I see this, you know, this is one of those times when you'll hear people come up and tell you that this is unprecedented, that this is time to build a new world order, a new financial system. And whenever I hear things like that, I put on my contrarian hat. Because I think at these points in time, it's, it's hazardous to try and think of completely new business models. You risk really throwing the baby out with the, with the bathwater if you do that. I would liken it more to one of those things you have to do with your PDAs when it hangs, you reset it. You say, go back to factory settings. And in a sense, I think it's time to do that, perhaps with the financial system. When I was studying here, the Glass-Eagle Act was just something you accepted. Bankers did banking, investment bankers didn't speculate too much. They were merchant bankers, as the British called them, a much more classy title referring to their passivity, which I think we need to return to. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, so I, you know, but in all seriousness, I think, I think we really have to not get too worked up. The advantage of being 53 is that you've lived through a couple of recessionary cycles. Things always return to normal. People do triumph. And as they say, you know, long, the king is dead, long live the king. You don't say long live the Politburo. So I hope you don't go back to drastic solutions. It's frightening to me to hear about the U.S. nationalizing banks. That's what Indira Gandhi did in India in 69, and we've labored long and hard to get past that. So I believe that we, you need to have patience, you need to recognize human resilience, you need to recognize that the U.S. is an extremely resilient economy, that you recognize problems quickly, you rush to fix them. My, my argument would be that the U.S. will probably recover faster from this than anyone else. And what you do need, as Meg said, is somebody who can help talk the markets up. Now our finance minister is meant to come here, he canceled, I wish he had been here because I think it would have been a good signal on the other hand, he's gone back, the market is up 8% tomorrow, today, so maybe he's doing something right, I don't know. <laughs> but he is doing the right thing. You asked about leadership, he's talking the market up, he's a picture of calm, serenity, and he's saying, we've seen this all, our banks are solid, our growth, underlying growth potential is high, not time to worry. And I think more people around the world should do that. Has this crisis shown that the, far from decoupling, uh, the world's economies are all connected uh, including the United States and the rest of the world. I agree. I, I I'm happily was never one of those who claimed that India or China were decoupled from the world, but there certainly was that euphoria. And ever since um, Goldman Sachs defined these economies as the BRIC economies, right. mm -hmm. um, we've been, I think we've been victim of hubris. In fact, like maybe the Hugh Bricks is what we should have been. We, <laughs> And, and frankly, I think the best thing that's happened with this crisis is that we've come off that pedestal. We are taking a much more reasoned and rational view of our comparative strengths. I do think India will come out of this much more unscathed than most economies. We're going to get hurt because the world today managing is about line dancing. It's not about solo performances. You have to be able to work with people. But I think we'll come out of this relatively unscathed, but certainly realizing the virtues of collaboration. Jeff. So, Charlie, I think uh, there started in August of 2007, kind of uh, this credit crisis began, uh, really driven by housing pricing declining and all of these synthetic vehicles that have been wrapped around mortgages. And basically, a 15-month process came to kind of a violent uh, ending, if you will, in the month of September, where we've just seen unprecedented activity uh, for the month. You know, I, I, my daughter was home from college a couple weeks ago, and I said to her, you know, I used to think Friday was my favorite day of the week, and now 
<laughs> Friday is just when the fun begins. You know? <laughs> yeah. Now you go through the weekend to find out what happened on Monday. Exactly. Now Tuesday is my, actually my favorite day of the week <laughs> on Tuesday. That's true. <laughs> but, so you, you've, you've had this uh, unbelievable uh, credit crisis. And, and I think earlier in the month of September, you really had some real concerns as to whether or not the system would fail. And the government increased the pace of its activity. And I, I'm pretty optimistic now. You know, I, my view on this stuff, Charlie, is always that the government always wins. It may take a month or six months or a year, but the government always wins. And the government's going to win this one as well in, in terms of the type of stimulus and the activity. And it seems like they're solving, trying to solve two problems. One is, how do you keep housing pricing from continuing to decline? And the other one is, how can you get banks to start lending money to each other again? How can you free up the credit? And so broadly speaking, all the stuff that I think Hank is doing and Tim Geithner and Ben Bernanke is really trying to solve those two problems. And, and I actually think there's more stability, and that will continue over time. And I'm confident that ultimately the government wins. Now, we've got to solve that problem because we're going to go into some form of economic downturn, you know, probably a recession, probably two quarters of negative growth. And we can attack that if we've got liquidity. But trying to solve a liquidity problem in a recessionary, you know, classic unemployment growing problem at the same time is very difficult. So I, I think the government's trying to solve the first one first. And then if we just have kind of a normal recession, we can solve that. There's pockets of growth around the world. There, there's new innovations. There's ways to get through that. And, and that's, the way, uh, that's the way I look at it. I, I think we've got an activist Fed. We've got an activist government, not just in the US, but around the world. And the activities are starting to get, I think, more rhythm. And ultimately, the, the, I, I actually think the system is actually stronger today than it was four weeks ago. What are you seeing in the markets <laughs> GE serves, not in terms of geographical, but product line? Look, it's two cities, Charlie. In other words, you know, in the financial service world, we're in the beginning of a normal credit cycle. Losses will grow. Uh, risk is being repriced, which I think is a very good thing. Uh, but financial services earnings will be crimped for a while. But you're going to get to a better place in financial services. You know, capitalism wasn't set up for people to get a mortgage for a home with no documentation or for four private equity guys to borrow $20 billion over a weekend with no commitment to repay. So that's, that was a bad place two years ago. We're going to get to a better place in financial services. Meanwhile, the demand for our infrastructure, our energy products, our environmental products, we've got a $170 billion backlog globally. And that doesn't seem to be slowing down. Now, you can't be naive. If there's no credit, that's going to get hit. Yeah. But, but in some ways, it's almost a bimodal economy right now. Right. John? Uh, three thoughts. You, you started with leadership, and I think this crisis uh, comes at an unfortunate time with respect to U.S. leadership, because for whatever you may think of President Bush, for him to stand up today and try to soothe the country is uh, not going to be effective. So it, it would be uh, far better if we had a Warren Buffett to reach out and to communicate to individuals that uh, their financial future and their place in the country and in the world uh, will be, can be, should be, I promise, better than it's been before. Taking a step back from that lack of uh, soothsayer, in, in the world I work in, which is entrepreneurs and innovators and scientists, uh, innovation is racing ahead, whether we have a credit crisis or not. So uh, the fundamentals for a, a better life, better markets, better products through innovation uh, remains more than constant. It's accelerating, and I think it's a reason for us all to have a great deal of hope as this works its way through our financial systems. Uh, but I think it's also important to put in context what's happening around the world. And uh, I, I heard it last weekend. It, it goes the following way. Uh, you can bail out the economy. You cannot bail out the environment. And so the same uh, cataclysm that we regard as unprecedented, we read about in the headlines of all of today's papers, I think is going to be viewed as a minor blip compared to what will happen if we don't uh, adequately, aggressively invest in and focus on uh, the challenges of uh, energy security, climate, uh, decarbonizing our economy and, and it comes full circle because those investments we can make in green in different ways of, uh, of, of living, of generating energy, of using it, 
uh, are the best opportunity we have to create new jobs uh, for the economy going forward. And in the end, I believe this is about jobs. That's where it strikes home. It's, it's wrong that so many people are gonna lose their homes, lose their jobs, because we all uh, constructed and were uh, created a, a financial system that didn't have enough transparency, didn't have enough accountability, and it will be further regulated in a response, as Jeff says, government always wins, to, uh, to, to meeting the needs of, of voters. Do you fear that, that whoever becomes president uh, in January 2009 will be subscribed in terms of what they can do and those things that you have been talking about and your friend Tom Friedman is talking about in the number one best-selling book in the country, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, may not be able to happen because the federal government will not have the resources necessary or be, to do those things? Well, quite to the contrary. I think the new president is gonna have uh, great scope to do things that the current president cannot. Uh, the, the next president will inherit a set of problems that are uh, far worse than, than he imagined when they set off on the campaign trail. But uh, I, I think the Americans, the world is gonna look for uh, strong leadership and uh, new leadership and fresh ideas, and, 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 and so I think he'll have greater scope. Uh, Jim? Well, I think I could add just a couple of footnotes to what my colleagues have said. In relation first to the banks, I think what we've seen is that the government has intervened in terms of capital adequacy and liquidity. This has been the $700 billion package, and we've seen that followed now in other parts of the world. The one thing that we don't have a fix on is what is the quality of the assets? What is the overhang? And uh, when I looked up the statistics of household debt, in 1978, uh, we had six or seven hundred billion dollars. Today we have 14 trillion dollars of household debt. And the real question is, if you have a bank and you're providing it with equity and you're giving it liquidity, on the other side, there are the assets. And are the assets any good? And I think that we're having a good feeling today because we've dealt with one side. We've dealt with the liability side of the balance sheet. But what's happening on the other side of the balance sheet, on the asset side of the balance sheet? And that's one observation. The second observation is that I think that with an interconnected world as we now have it, we've had the epicenter here indeed at the World Bank meetings uh, in the last couple of days, the US representative apologize to the G7 for it all having started here. But it started here and it's now rippling. And the issue that I worry about is two things. First, the effect on the other G7 countries and they're mobilizing. But what we've not yet seen, I think, is the response of the other seven, of the other five billion people in the world, uh, one of which, of course, is India, uh, who I'm happy to say seems less worried than I thought you might be. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, but there are another five billion people in the world and we've been counting on them as an engine of growth and an engine uh, that would take us forward to the sort of future that we're all hoping for for the planet. I'm delighted that G has so many orders and it gives me a sense that maybe that's not going to be affected, but uh, what I'm hearing is that you're seeing now the ripple effect going through. Certainly all the stock markets in the developing world have dropped 50%, some 60%. These are not trivial moves when they drop 50 and 60%. Our own market has dropped from 20 trillion to 12 trillion. So that's not a trivial mood either. <laughs> so I'm just a little worried about uh, not the steps that have been taken from a financial and liquidity point of view, I just wonder about what are the ripple effects, what is the question of the validity of the assets that we have in our system. Okay. Let me ask you this. I mean, clearly the imperative of the moment is to get banks to lend to each other. Absolutely. That's number one, mm -hmm. and get the credit, you know, uh, get their <coughs> liquidity beginning. Is the administration and are the governments like Great Britain doing the right thing by taking an ownership stake in those banks? Well, I think there's probably at the moment no one else to take. <laughs> right. So that I think they're doing a, a job that is necessary. And I think knowing many of those people, they would probably quite quickly want to get out of it as soon as yeah. the, the system is, is, uh, is settled down. Well, let me just interrupt that. Is it possible then that if in fact by the government taking these steps, 
that private capital, whether it's sovereign wealth funds or whether it's uh, Warren Buffett, whoever it might be, will begin to, to take equity interests as they have done in terms of preferred stock with respect to GE and with respect to Goldman Sachs. Will we see more of that if the government is able to get through this immediate Crisis. I think if you can calm down the fears about financial institutions, private sector will come back in and want at low prices to enter and buy equity. And that, I think, is clear. But what the governments are doing now is providing security to the system, liquidity to the system. But I get back again to the question is, what is the underlying strength of these institutions? What are the assets? Uh, are they capable of restoring value? And to me, that is the unanswered question. Jeff would know much more about this than I would. And, yep. and, uh, well, uh, no, I think we're in the beginning of a credit cycle, and if you did bad underwriting, your assets aren't worth much. And if you did good underwriting, then you're gonna make a lot of money as this market comes through, just like what happened in 1991 or in 1982. Uh, you know, so really the firms that lost their underwriting standards between 2001 and 2007 are still going to have toxic assets on their books. And people that never lost their underwriting standards are going to serve to make a lot of money, lot of money. this cycle. Okay. And really, you know, the financial service industry is a massive industry. People are going to make a boatload of money in that industry over the next 10 years. So, you know, th some of what's going on here is just not all bad. It, it just isn't. There's going to be consolidation. There's certainly going to be more regulation. But it's not like this massive industry, the world's biggest industry, is going to go away. It's just not. Anand? No, I, I agree. And um, I remember one of my first professors here when I was a freshman, professor of banking, very senior person. And um, he came in and said, you know, banking is the same that it's always been. It's about building relationships. Frankly, we thought he was a little out of tune with the times at that point when <laughs> Goldman was on its rapid rise and relationships weren't in sight anywhere. But I think he was right. I think banking ultimately is about evaluating people, evaluating your client, their underlying creditworthiness, their governance models, their integrity, and then really understanding their assets. As somebody who went straight from B school to apprenticing in an electric arc steel furnace and then into companies which make things. This crisis makes you believe in God again, frankly, you know, that people <laughs> do value the smokestack industries where people make things. So I think it's a good reset that's happening. I believe banking will survive. Uh, we are in, one of our businesses is the largest rural finance company in India. So it's, I'm not hitting on the finance industry because I'm not familiar with it. That's a growth engine for us. But we lend in India's rural areas. We are growing at 40% a year because we are lending to real people. We're very careful about the non-productive assets we might have. So I think, I agree with Jeff, I think it's time just for a reset to go back to the old fundamental principles well, and everyone will make money again. <laughs> Is it also time for the business schools and the people who are coming out of business schools like Harvard and Stanford and, and all the great business schools around the world to not necessarily all rush to Wall Street and financial engineering, but go into, say, John came from, I think, electrical engineering? Uh, and then went to Harvard Business School. I mean, is it one result of what we're going through is it will see a shift from people not beating a path to Wall Street, but also, you know, as Jeff went into marketing at Procter & Gamble, as I remember. Uh, what do you think? Or, or what do you hope? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was one of those people who went to Bain and Company, yeah, so. <laughs> so to consulting, yes. Um, I, 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 you know, I think what, there's a couple of observations that I would make about where we are. One is, while I agree that the financial system will rebound and, and the financial industry as we know it will, will continue to thrive, what I worry about in the next four to five years is the consumer. 72% of our GDP is consumer driven. And I would contrast that with 60% of the GDP in Germany because the government is so much bigger. And if you see the consumer, and in the recessions that I have lived through, which was 1987, 1991, and then the dot-com bubble burst in 2001, the common factor in all those recessions was the consumer kept spending. Right. 
And what you're seeing now, you're seeing dramatic consumer pullback. And if the consumer pulls back, they're not going to buy goods from companies who are then going to lay, lay off people who are then going to pull back more. And what I worry about is enough being done to solidify the consumer base of the United States so that we don't end up in a four or a five or a six year very deep recession. And so it's not all just about the quality of the assets and the financial services industry. We have to remember this is about real people in their homes driving their cars. And my personal point of view is we have not done enough to think about how we're going to shore up this consumer spending base. Um, with regard to coming out of business yeah, well, school. Well, well, before you go to there, yeah. I mean, how might we do that? I mean, there are people, as you know, uh, uh, certain people have suggested that the government ought to do, Felstein here at Harvard, yeah. that it ought to do more, John McCain has talked about this, ought to do more in terms of somehow guaranteeing some of these mortgages to shore up yeah. the consumers. I mean, where this all started, of course, was lending to people who couldn't pay it, pay it back right. to buy houses. And until we see a bottoming of these house prices, I think we are going to continue to be in trouble. And the only way so, to do that is? Well, I think the, the notion of buying up these distressed mortgages, replacing people's mortgages with a 30-year fixed rate mortgage that allows them to stay in their home is a very good first start. The stimulus package was $150 billion. I think it worked to some extent. I'm not sure there doesn't need to be another stimulus package of some kind that shores up the fundamental consumer spending. And I think if you have the shore up of the, of the consumer spending, the financial services market writes themselves, then the entrepreneurship cycle can get going with the venture capital back in, in business and things like that. So I think that's, that's a bit of the issue. Let me ask this generally on behalf of this audience. We talked about the next two quarters, I mean, somewhere in 2009. Um, other people think it'll take us a couple of years to get out of this, not two quarters, um, but eight quarters. Uh, where do you go down the line here and tell me, you know, what are the, what are your worst, what are your, why do you believe, where do you believe it, how long will it take us to get out of it, and then uh, what might change that dynamic? Jeff? Let me give you a really succinct answer. I don't know. No. Okay, how's that? Um, did they teach and I'm you, not sure it matters. Did, did, that did I they know. teach you at Harvard Business School to say, I don't know? <laughs> uh, I, I think if, if we don't fix liquidity <laughs> and if people can't get credit, you know, in other words, this fat cat versus uh, Main Street argument, right? right? So if you're making a tractor, let's say in Iowa, for every dollar of tractor you sell, there's $10 of financing. It's inventory financing on your supply chain, it's, it's your dealer getting floor planning, things like this. So this notion that it's, you know, fat cat versus Main Street thing is just wrong. I mean, liquidity is, you know, the first thing that shuts down is a car dealer in, in Iowa, you know, and then blah, 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 it goes from there. So, my own sense is that if we can get liquidity back in the system <clears throat> and we can make sure that the productive capacity of not just the U.S. but globally, you know, continues to pull forward, then you've got enough momentum that it doesn't necessarily have to be a long recession, you know, because there are engines of the world that still work. There's big problems to be solved. There's people that want to invest in health care and energy and things like that that will create jobs. But if, but if the liquidity crisis, the credit crisis continues for several quarters or through 09, then that only has the impact of slowing the economy down further, creating more unemployment and things like that. So I think it's kind of binary and, I, and that's why I believe it's important for the government to be working where it is today on freeing up liquidity so that you can face whatever economic downturn we have and people will be investing money in productive capacity and things like that. So that's. Jim? I, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, the figures today indicate that household debt to income is around 130%, and 10 years ago it was 100%. So you see this enormous increase in debt that households are taking on. Does it really matter whether, <clears throat> whether there's liquidity if there's a fundamental issue of borrowing capacity? I'm sure that, that there is the issue of liquidity, which I understand. Jim, the only point I make is that lack of liquidity plus high unemployment probably doesn't solve that problem. Yeah. You know, in other words, I know how it can get worse. I'm not sure how long it takes to get better. 
And I think that's what the government's kind of fighting for now is time so it doesn't get remarkably worse. This amount of illiquidity with 10% unemployment is a really bad thing. Yeah. And that's, and that's you know, because of the debt. And so I think that's what we're kind of fighting for. Now, look, you know, I'm sold out of jet engines for three years. I'm sold out of wind turbines for three or four years. You know, that, that's, that's a good thing. Mm. That, but if there's no lending capacity, then can people finance that? Can people? Well, are you beginning to hear like that, that already? People calling up and saying, you know, let's talk about my order, and 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 maybe I can slow it down, or maybe we can adjust it. Or Not maybe. yet, but I think you're crazy if you don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. You know. Now, now, why don't they? Because a new jet engine is 25 percent more fuel efficient than what it replaces, mm -hmm. and with oil still at 80 dollars, that's still four times higher than the last, the average of the last 25 years. Yeah. So it's still important, but I think. That, that's why I think it's so important what the government's working on right now to make sure that they can get some of that back into the system. Yeah. John. The, the big picture, uh, the jet engines are great, is America has been borrowing money from China to buy oil from the Middle East, and then we're burning it. We're throwing it up in the atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> Hope, I pray we're going to get liquidity, but that borrow, buy, burn, every part of that has got to stop. And it's got to stop in the next decade, or we are going to have a carbon crisis that's going to make this financial crisis look like it's a walk in the park. Yeah. Yeah. More on that. Go ahead. Just to bring in a, a, a bit of a global angle, as I suppose my task is to do today. Um, you know, we've got liquidity issues, which are correct, Jeff, but I'm very glad you brought up tractors. That's my main business. <laughs> I can, I, I worked it out with him before. He's going to make a plug and use tractors as an example. And we have, you know, a, a fairly major share here, and we are seeing this as an opportunity to build share. We are creating our own finance company in the U.S., which we never had before and was a disadvantage versus our competitors. And when it comes to financing that, we are going to where the global pools of capital are today. So I'm looking at the Middle East, which has, because of the 3B syndrome you're talking about, has a huge amount of money and doesn't know what to do with it. So we go out there and we're saying, why don't we do a JV in the finance? So I think the key is that there are global sources of liquidity. And why I'm optimistic about America is that give, if you ask anyone still in such fragile times where they would like to invest and put their money, I would say eight times out of 10, it's still going to be America because there is fundamental strength. There is fundamental free markets. There is an ability to grow and to be entrepreneurial. So I will invest in that finance company. I just won't look for liquidity here. I look for it where it exists. Right. Uh, may I come uh, let me come to John first. The, uh, uh, we haven't talked about sort of venture capital and, and entrepreneurship. Uh, what's the impact of that in the world that you operate in from Silicon Valley? So of this the, crisis. The, the so world not of selling tractors. You're we're not investing in the future. We're not selling tractors. We're, we're doing three things. Uh, we've got the uh, internet engineers, and they're working on the digital economy. Uh, we have the biotech engineers, and so the digital engineers are messing with the bits and the bytes. We've got the biotech engineers who are working with the bugs and the drugs, and then finally <laughs> we've got we've got the green tech engineers, and they're working with biofuels and batteries. Now, what's going on is that the the, uh, the digital engineers, we've got too many inconsequential internet projects. There's a great flood of those, $100 billion worth of venture capital, but those are real businesses and they're not deeply capital intensive. Uh, the biotech pharmaceutical projects take more capital and more time and innovation continues there, jobs are being created there. And the green economy is the great rush now. That's where all the new and incremental dollars are going. None of these businesses fundamentally rely on a lot of credit, okay? These are equity-driven businesses, but they have varying degrees of capital intensivity. It's in the green world, though, to get real scale in these projects, there is some finance or some credit required. So what I expect to happen is a lot of internet ventures are gonna disappear. The amount of dollars that venture capitalists are investing is going to uh, uh, decline. None of these ventures are immune from the economy, so they're all going to hurt in, in, in that regard. Uh, and, and, and perhaps the green the most of them, because if they're 
I, I just can't imagine that we won't have credit for a long period of time. What I expect will happen is it, is it will be more expensive. The real question that I've been worrying about is in prior recessions, when I worked at Intel under the uh, tutelage and whip of Andy Grove, he, he would say that the right thing to do in a recession is to invest more. It's to power ahead, to use market weakness to gain advantage on your competitors. Uh, the small ventures that I work with don't have the same resources as an Intel, so I expect they're gonna scale back, but scale back R&D the least so that they can, will advise them to use this time to gain advantage, to accelerate their new product to the marketplace. And, and I'm interested in how GE will look at that same question. In this economy, do you scale back? What do you emphasize more of? You know, less John, of? I, I've always been a big kind of solve the problem kind of guy. You know, in other words, uh, we've got in financial services the opportunity to do, I, I think, unique investing in this cycle. But the financial service world is gonna be different. You're gonna to have to take cost out, and I think that's all actually quite positive. And so we need to take strong actions in our financial service business. But in our energy business and in our infrastructure business, this is a great time to pour it on. Right. This is the perfect time to pour it on. You know, we've got the scale, we've got the staying power, we've got the technical footprint. And, and so, you know, we never do everything as a cookie cutter. Right. You know, we, we go in and say, okay, here's what we have to do in this business. Maybe we've got to sell this business. Here's how we retrench. Here's where we go. But in our, in our uh, green tech business and our clean energy and our water and our, and our transportation businesses, this is the perfect time to get competitive Double down. advantage. Okay, well, you know, you we did it. Let me tell you, on September 12th of 2001, there wasn't one person in the world that wanted to be in the commercial aviation business, okay? We had 75% market share of jet, of jet engines and we owned 1,200 aircraft. You know, <laughs> so you're in that business. Yeah, right. You're in the business. So we invested a billion dollars a year in R&D coming through that. We got uh, specific uh, uh, applications coming through that cycle. Our market share grew. Now we've got the installed base from that that's gonna help us in the, wherever this downturn goes. That's the way we have to think about it. I remind Jeff that he doesn't need any reminding, but uh, he'd been in, he'd been the CEO of General Electric, I think one week as of September 9, 2001. When you say power down, when you say double down, when you say power up, what does it mean? Acquisitions, does it mean what? You know, again, More I, customers, you're market gonna share. See, th think about the, in the last two weeks, the hardest hit uh, uh, part of the stock market hasn't been financials, it's been industrial companies. Some companies have lost 30 or 40 percent of their market cap in the last two weeks. Now, personally, I, so you're going to get offensive opportunities as time goes on. But we've got a big enough footprint. You know, one of the things that we've done a lot more of is, again, organic growth. Keep investing in R&D, develop new products, things like that. And also partnerships with guys like John. You, you know, my, my own, our own belief is that uh, GE can be a great aggregator for venture capitalist companies that have a range of technologies. And the thing we're probably as good as anybody in the world at is we can take a, a business from 10 or 20 million dollars to a billion dollars better than anybody in the world. John gets them from zero to 20. 20. Better than I, he does it better than I do, you know, and probably always will. But we are great at scaling up businesses, and I think there's gonna be a good opportunity to scale up businesses during this cycle. Do you essentially agree with his sort of outlook in terms of where the future is, in terms of green technology, in terms of biotech, in terms of all those areas? Well, we're never gonna be an information technology company, but when you think about clean energy and water, in uh, what we call early health. Those are two of the pillars that GE is gonna be a big part of for decades. Okay. And so, you know, I'd say John's well, got two out of well, three of them right. When, when you looked at the future, these were places you wanted to be, you went, not like to be. The political campaign so far, the two candidates, are receiving a, a fair amount of criticism because they have not addressed this uh, in the judgment of many people as well as they should have. That most people did not give them high marks in the debate in terms of being responsive and connecting with the American people about reassurance. Right. Uh, I mean, have we had a failure on the part of our presidential candidates to speak to this because it's a time to be cautioned in their minds rather than bold? Well, I think there's a couple things going on. One is this is unfolding real time. I mean, everyone on this panel 
you know, at the beginning of September might have thought it was going to be unfold a little differently than it has. And it's very hard when you're in the middle of a political campaign to react on a day-to-day -day unfolding basis, because if you say something on Monday that turns out to be wrong on Wednesday, that's not a good place for either candidate to be. So I think both candidates are trying to step up their efforts to address the economy, to put out solutions, to have a debate about what ought to be done, at the same time making sure that they are connected to um, Henry Paulson, to Ben Bernanke, so that we are in some ways speaking with one voice. And um, I think you will see over the next, we have 21 more days left on the campaign, and I think both candidates have resolved to make this the number one issue, what they will talk about almost every day. But it has not been perfect, I agree with you. There's been some, some starts and stops, and, and, but I must say it's challenging given the, the ever-changing and unfolding nature of the crisis. Whenever someone goes from business into politics, I mean, this is a question I've asked of Henry Paulson uh, and a lot of other people, Jim Wolfenson as well. What, in your involvement in the presidential campaign of John McCain uh, and the act of leadership, how is it different from the act of leadership as a CEO? Well, it's much more challenging in many ways. Yeah. Because as a CEO, um, we put the right people in the right job, we set a strategy, and then we make the decision about how we want to go forward. Every one of us on this stage makes a decision about what we want to do. And then, by the way, the organization follows that decision because you're the CEO. It's good to be the CEO. Or else. <laughs> That is not the way it works in politics, of course. And um, so the, the, the amount of time on consensus building, the ability to um, get the right direction to bring the most number of people behind you is far more challenging. And when you set a course in politics, almost by definition, 40% of the people don't subscribe right, to right, your theory. Right. So I would say leadership is much, much different in that regard. But some of the same things are absolutely true. It's about inspiration. It's about communication. It is about getting the right people in the right job at the right time but, to but be part of your team. Then are you dismayed when this campaign becomes a, a question about Bill Ayers or it becomes a question uh, about uh, issues that are not relevant to how well that person can handle this economic crisis? I don't mean to single out Ayers as one. Yeah. But in a sense, it, it, it's, it, a lot of people look at where we are and they're saying, you know, why is this campaign devolved into where it is? Well, I think, um, you know... <laughs> so that John McCain had literally, over the weekend, say, Barack Obama's a good person. Sure. Well, I think, as I said, this is a, a moving target. There's lots of things going on in the environment. But I think everyone in America wants to hear the two candidates talk about what they're going to do about the economy, beginning, middle, and end of story. While they are interested in Iraq and they're interested in other things, what has happened in the last three months is the economy has risen to the top of every single person's mind in the United States. And that's because it is affecting average people in their everyday lives in a way that it was not even six months ago. So I think you're going to see this take place at a much higher level. You're going to see both candidates focus on the issues. We have another debate this week. And uh, I trust and, and hope that, that that debate will be, um, you know, lively and focused on the very issues that we're talking about here today. Jim Wolfenson, what do you want the candidates to say? What is it that you think is missing from not only the political debate, but the conversation uh, that's taking place uh, among people in decision-making places? Well, I think the first thing is that it's natural in a political campaign that uh, people look at the short-term domestic issues. And they also look at the involvement of the United States internationally in wars and the, the extent that it affects us. The thing that I yearn for is a, a positioning of, of the campaign, but more than the campaign, their view of leadership, to the longer-term issues. Uh, one of them, uh, John has referred to, which is the environment, which cannot be put off in terms of political cycle. It's something which is pressing on us constantly, and it's also not just a domestic issue. It is a global issue. Uh, the impact of, uh, uh, on the environment of India and China is far greater in terms of increment than what is happening in the United States at the moment. So what I miss in the campaign is, first of all, that. Secondly, the positioning of our country in terms of a world which will move from six to nine billion people where a hundred million of that three billion only is in the rich countries and where the expectation is that the 75 percent of global gdp which is now earned by the oecd countries by 2050 becomes 35 percent 
Now we may be off 5%, and it may not happen in 2050, it may not happen in 2060. But the issues that I see and worry about are the issues of the changing dynamics, a move back to Asia in every sense. Uh, China and India in 1815 were 50% of the global GDP. Come 2050, they'll be 45% of global GDP. They're now 7 or 8%. These are tectonic shifts which are not being addressed. Now, they don't appeal to the voter in a local community who's worried about his home mortgage, that I understand. And so the campaign is necessarily about local issues. But I just hope that when we get a government in power, that whoever it is will immediately start trying to assert the issue of American understanding of these issues and then hopefully American leadership. It is not there at the moment. Uh, the interesting point there, and therefore the question I raise now is this, you know, what's changed because of the crisis we're going through? You and I were talking in India. Uh, you said that in somehow it's removing the last shackles of believing. I, I know um, Charlie was talking about uh, confidence and he was asking my colleagues here about confidence and how to bring it back. And I just told him there's a strange twist on the word confidence out in India because um, in India one of the things that's held entrepreneurialism back and real world-class ambition back was what I call the residue of colonial inferiority complexes. You just never thought you could be big enough or good enough or you could compete with the best. And just as an example, I was a, a founder investor in what is now one of India's uh, leading private sector banks, Kotak Mahindra, a brilliant entrepreneur who started it. And I took him out to Wall Street and we forged uh, the first joint venture Goldman Sachs had ever done in the world. But we went out looking for a joint venture. You didn't say, I can be Goldman Sachs. What's happened very interestingly after this uh, crisis here is that people are sitting around the world saying, you know, I could be Goldman Sachs and I don't have to do a joint venture anymore. In India, it's been a slow trajectory of building confidence. There was first the IT boom the outsourcing boom which made Indian companies like Infosys feel we could be amongst the best. And then there was Ellen Mittal who created the world's largest steel company. But you still thought that Wall Street was unassailable. That's where the masters of the universe sat. And that you'd have to use them to fuel your growth and liquidity. And suddenly I've got Uday Kota, my, the founder of this bank saying, you know, I could be the new Wall Street. Now, again, back to hubris. You have to worry about arrogance. Yes. But I think for a country yeah. that's struggled under colonialism and inferiority complexes, it's good. So you're going to see new people invigorated with confidence, which is a funny byproduct of this kind of crisis. Well, now I saw an article the other day about you think about getting into the motorcycle business as well as the SUV business. Do you think of your company as being, we could be the General Motors, or do you want to be the General Motors? I think you answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> The second one was purely yeah. rhetorical, Sometimes I'm sure. Yeah. Of that. <laughs> no, but I, I have great respect uh, for General Motors. I just think that um, I'm a great believer in brands, and I think we, it's time Indians started building global brands, and it's easier to build them with a niche focus. It's easier to build a Harley Davidson than to build uh, a, you know, the largest motorcycle company in the world if you believe in branding. So that's where... Uh, I don't want to dump on size or General Motors, but I think we have a very fixed chance of building niche global brands finally. Okay, and especially in the U.S. market, penetrating the U.S. market. Uh, Jeff, you mentioned the fact that, that you bet on government. Um, when all of this is said and done, whether it's we began to see real blight at the end of the tunnel in, in, in a year or two years or even if it's longer, has something fundamentally changed about our sense of government and the nature of capitalism? I think, Charlie, the answer is yes, for sure. I, I don't, personally, I think it, hap it started to happen. Y you, you had the end of the bubble economy, 9-11, uh, uh, Enron, all happened more or less at the same time, 2001. Uh, I think for the previous 20 years of my career, uh, there was no interface between business and government at all. In fact, it was actually frowned upon, it was considered to be unimportant. I think coming out of that was a more aggressive regulatory framework, was uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, I, I'd say government and business looking at certain industries together, healthcare, things like that over time. 
And then what's going to come out of this is clearly more regulatory uh, focus in the financial service sector. And, and so you're going to see this intermingling of what I think started actually at the beginning of this decade is probably going to become a more part of all of our lives as, as, uh, as time goes forward. We're clearly going to get more, re more regulation. In clearly in something that has the dimensions of the global climate change and the dependence on seven billion dollar dependence on uh, oil you're going to see as Friedman and you have pointed out it's a market cannot do it alone so Correct. you're going to have to see a role of government a leadership role in government we're, we're going to witness it's going to be uh, the combined effect of uh, a policy together with private capital to create uh, the greatest economic opportunity, I say, ever to deal with the greatest challenge we've ever dealt with ever. You can't be in the energy business and not be affected by the policies. And, uh, and you cannot be in the energy business, I believe now, without innovating. So these two have got to come together. The part of government that's most missing, however, uh, it is uh, funding for research and development, and as Jeff likes to say, the billion dollar base load deployments. And that's only gonna come from government. It's not gonna come from the uh, taxpayers off the rate base in Pennsylvania. So our, our government's been missing in action. The total federal investment in renewables R&D is less than a billion dollars a year. If you roll the clock back 20 years ago to when uh, Meg and I were helping build technology companies in the infancy of the internet, we had a, a, a part of the Department of Defense called DARPA. Right. And DARPA literally created the internet. Right. Not Al Gore, DARPA. It created the computer-aided design industry. Uh, it, it created uh, uh, computer science as a discipline, was funded out of this group, independent of congressional oversight and uh, pork barrel allocations of projects by district. Since then, DARPA has become very mission-oriented. And one of the best things the next president could do would be to restore DARPA to uh, uh, its former charter and its former agenda, which was to create real advantage for the American economy and also the world in, in the form of uh, that form of uh, research, research and development. Let me make a couple points just to reinforce what John said. Charlie. I, I, first thing I'd say is um, if a, one of the camps was asked how to prioritize last week at the debate some of the big issues, I would put energy first because it's eminently solvable. You know, in other words, if you look at the R&D spent since the end of World War II in this country, you got huge defense, you got huge health care, you've got huge NASA, things like that. You've got nothing spent on energy for fundamentally 50 years. It's not like there has to be a lot of inventions in renewables or in making the grid more efficient. There's a lot of just off-the-shelf technology that can be commercialized and, and, and deployed relatively quickly. So, you know, John and I have had a lot of conversations on this. You know, the, the notion of a clean energy future is upon us, we will create jobs, the technology exists, the entrepreneurial spirit's there, and, and, and that can evolve over time, number one. Number two, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong Republican. Uh, I believe in free markets. The notion that the government is it the catalyst for change in this country? It's just purely garbage. You know, the, the government has always been a catalyst. Has always been a ca You know, we're the broadest company in the world. We're in every industry. Guess what? The government is in every industry we're in, from media to financial services to aircraft engines to healthcare. And this notion that the that the quote unquote free market solves everything has never been true. Isn't true today. And and the government does have a role to be a catalyst for change in these industries that we participate in and can be a positive, I think, catalyst for change. You agree with that? Well, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. But here's the key thing about owning the alternative energy future, and, I, and I'm with, with John and Jeff, is that innovation is the only way small countries, and we're a small country relative to India and relative to China, it's the only way we're going to stay ahead. And the great thing about owning this alternative energy future is once we get it figured out, there's going to be lots of countries who we can export this technology to. Yeah. And I think we have both 
uh, presidential candidates have talked about the moonshot of our generation, which is how do we become energy independent in the next 10 years, and um, how do we own this next big, huge wave of innovation that I agree, along with biotech, and I don't think the internet is completely done. I might, uh, I might disagree <laughs> with John on that. Um, but I think we've got to continue to own these waves of innovation because that's how we stay ahead of small com countries with much lower labor rates than we will ever have in the United but, but, States. And the role of government as a catalyst, as what? As a, I think a partner. Um, a partner. I think it's a partner. I think, you know, you can, can do public-private partnerships around um, research. A lot of the great research comes out of universities. Most of the universities are government funded. The University of California system is a hotbed of the <laughs> best battery technology in the world right now. So I think there's partnerships that can be done that accelerate the pace of change. I also think there's something to getting the entire country focused on something that we want to do together. I think the American people are dying to be asked. I think they are dying to be asked to help solve the problem. And one of the great tragedies of 9-11 is that we didn't ask right. the American people to do much about um, you know, getting off foreign oil or doing something that was going to make the world a better place. In fact, we said go shopping. Correct. No, Jim. <coughs> when, when. Which wasn't all bad right then, yeah. but no. Yeah. I, I think that the points that are being made are really important because 40, 50 years ago when I started getting in the business, the great advantage the United States had was wealth. Uh, it had the money to put into yep. things. Having just come from the bank meetings in Washington, I was struck by the fact that I met with the Chinese finance minister whose $1.7 trillion of foreign exchange reserves. India, I think, has 400 billion or some such number, three to 400 billion. The Russians have 500 billion. We have 72 billion. So that's the first thing. Uh, and the debt levels that we have in our country, the ability to fund, are just so completely out of whack with what they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. So the one thing that can save us is really technology and innovation because we can't buy it anymore. We don't have the money to do it. Right. We're dependent on the rest of the world. We're borrowing uh, more than we're spending. We did $800 billion more borrowing last year than we earned. So our country has to be forced back to innovation, but we, we also need to, and I just raise the issue, that this question of fiscal responsibility is going to become a huge issue for whoever is the next government because we cannot keep going through 10 trillion uh, dollars when we started eight years ago at four, three or four. It, it's just not sustainable. And so all we're talking about has to be viewed within that economic context. Um, any, anybody? Jim. <laughs> yeah. uh, when you talk about this Teutonic shift in, in, that we have seen in Asia and in BRIC countries, I mean, there is in today's paper a big story about Russia and what's going on over there and how they're feeling the impact. You know, and on the one hand, as all this, this is about leadership, as all this oil revenue and gas revenue mm. came in to Russia, uh, at the same time, little of it was spent on infrastructure and changing the country while they had these revenues in. And, and uh, it, it shows you the kinds of demands on leadership. That's my only point. But where do you see America going uh, because of the parallel things. One, uh, the Teutonic shift to Asia, coupled by this economic crisis. Finally, the notion that, that a lot of people think, you know, are, are pointing their finger at America now and saying, you know, uh, this is because you let things get out of control and it washed over us and you're the blame. Well, I think that we have to take a look at ourselves, particularly at universities since we're in one, looking at our educational system, looking at the way we're preparing our young people. Only 8% of our young graduates go to Asia. They still go to Europe and Spain and England and other places. We have hundreds of thousands of Chinese and Indians in our country who are coming to our country and are no longer staying here, they're going back. <laughs> we make them go back. Yeah, but, but we, but we do. <laughs> and, and you, so, you said we make them go back. Yeah, right, right, right. But, and, but, and, and some people suggesting we should stamp a green card to their diploma. Well, that's... Uh, 
I was here when the registration was taking place at the Harvard Coop, and I saw that there are quite a lot of Asians are coming to Harvard at this moment. I don't know what the number is, but it certainly seemed like a lot. But I think that the, the point that I'd, I'd just like to make is that we need to understand that the center of, of intellectual weight, the center of economic activity, is, as at least a challenge to us, moving <laughs> eastward. And I think that we need to get our educational institutions to understand that it's no longer a transatlantic world. We yeah. need to be preparing our young people yeah. for a global world which has a weight in Asia. And this is where I see the Harvard Business School and other places needing uh, to put weight. Yeah, yeah I'd make uh, two points, uh, Charlie. You know, the. Um, 60% of our revenues this year will be outside the United States. Right. So in every way, we see the global opportunities to be very profound, number one. Number two, I think there's got to be a new segmentation of globalization. You know, BRIC, I think, has become passe. Uh, emerging and, and developed worlds, you know, <laughs> if you got in a Boeing 777 and Terminal 3 in Beijing and flew to JFK, you'd have a hard time picking what was the emerging nation, what was the developed, <laughs> what was the developed world. Yeah. So I, I think that's passe. That. Yeah. We do three segments now. We, we, we kind of go for uh, one segment is uh, natural resource rich, Australia, Russia, Middle East, Africa, Brazil. These countries we tend to interface you know, in, with in a very common way in terms of what they buy from us. Uh, People-driven regions, China, India, Southeast Asia, you've got to be committed to making those your second home market or else you're not going to be able to compete. So you've got to be very committed to be a local in India, local in China, places like that. And then the uh, technology education rich regions, Western Europe, Japan, and we segment the world in a different way and I think that even that changes over time. Second point I'd make is, you know, I get to travel the world and talk to people that are in leadership and you see over and over again that every country in the world has to work on competitiveness. And there are really four pillars to a competitive society. It's education, it's healthcare, it's an energy policy, and it's a, it's a financial system that promotes innovation, those four things. Whether you're in Turkey, whether you're in France, whether you, and so we need to not assume that we're competitive. We need to be working as hard in those areas as every place else in the world is gonna work on those areas, and if we don't, we're gonna fall behind. And so I, I think in my generation, we could assume that we would be competitive. I think we now have to work to make sure, as, as an American, we've gotta to work to make sure that we can compete toe to toe with everybody in the world. Our children can't assume it the way we could, and we're gonna to have to all work on those, those areas. Uh, again, this is about leadership. So we got a new leader for the country in January. Um, I mean, give me the, what you hope that person will do um, in order to guarantee that. Look, I, I, I think national defense and things like that, not my area of expertise. I'm gonna have to work on that. I, I just think, it, you know, again, this is m my belief. I'm not an expert. I stick on those four areas, but I would have very clear, definitive plans on what you wanna get done. You're not gonna solve healthcare in the next, uh, 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 eight years, but you can have three things that you want to get done that are generally going to move the nation in the right direction. And so I, I just think those are, yeah. pick those four areas, but have two or three clear objectives you're going to do in each one. Now, now, tell me how you think the world sees the United States right now, because in an interview I did with the foreign minister of Russia uh, while during the UN session, he said the following, you know, we want the United States, we want the United States to be first among equals. You know, we're not looking to be a rival superpower. We want the United States to be first among equals, but we want the United States to consult. We want the United States, in a sense, to ask. We want the United States to hear. What does India want from the United States? What does the world that you know, which is the entire world, want from the United States in terms of leadership? Uh, first, there was this uh, very interesting study that was done a year ago, I think, about uh, an opinion poll taken of what people around the world think and whether they have positive or negative views on the US. And India had the highest rating in terms of people who think positively of the United States. We were outliers completely. <laughs> it, it was like we were the only country that was engaged in a love affair with the and, United and States. And why was that? You know, um, 
maybe because I make vehicles, I think I'm going to say first, we love the open road, and I'm using that metaphorically. We like democracy, we like freedom, we stand out for individualism, and this is the Mecca where all that is worshipped. And I think there's a very deep bond despite other shallow political uh, differences we might have. Coming to your question about how do we see America right now, let me talk about India. I, we, are, we are sort of schizophrenic right now. Our head's with John McCain and our heart is with Obama. <laughs> because John McCain you know, is criticized by his opposition here for being somebody who's going to simply carry on Bush's policies. We had no problem with Bush's policies. <laughs> <laughs> So we, because number one, well, what, which policies did you like? Well, <laughs> okay, I can see the quicksand opening up in front of you. Know, yeah, this. On all but, sides. But Bush <laughs> continued the opening up of India, which Bill Clinton had started. He didn't subvert that. The uh, the trade agreements, the nuclear agreements. He he always stood out against the most rabid opponents of outsourcing yeah. and offshoring. So. In a sense, and the anyone, nuclear thing was crucial. The nuclear thing is crucial. He recognized India as an emerging global power, so we would have no problem with the continuity of those policies. On the other hand, Indians, I think, like the rest of the world, are fascinated, charmed by Obama's spirit, the new that he represents, the reinvigoration uh, of America. And I have to say that if I forget about the vested interests of India, I think a choice of Obama would somehow signal the finest that America has to offer. Diversity, <laughs> democracy. We'll give you. Yeah. I mean, and any... Anod Meg's going to give an elbow right in the chops here. <laughs> Can I come there? Yeah. <laughs> you better come here. No, go ahead. <laughs> but any country after 9-11 can elect a president whose middle name is Hossein and not worry about it and not be paranoid about it, I think is an amazing country. Yeah. It has an ability to be democratic, to forgive, to be inclusive. And I think the world is waiting to, to forget. The world is waiting to forget Iraq, wait, waiting to forget what they see as the egregious parts of American expansionism. Wait, and I think that, that is a kind of salve that probably will help. And, and you know, India suffers from collateral terrorism as a result of our closeness to the U.S. Because we are allied with the U.S., the number of bomb blasts that have gone up in India after and before the signing of the nuclear agreement are because they see us as an ally. So if terrorism survives, if the Al-Qaeda survives and is still very rapidly anti-American, we get hit. So in that sense, as I said, we are schizophrenic. We think Obama could bring a new spirit of forgiving around the world. But as I said, if I go back to outsourcing, offshoring, trade, my vote would go for McCain. I don't have a vote, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but, but does Obama suggest policies that, uh, that are against that in terms of, are you suggesting protectionism? Or are you suggesting trade policies? I'm, I'm not an expert in American politics, but Meg would probably well, tell me her, I that, <laughs> that, you know, in the heat of the run-up to a campaign, people say things that they may not always uh, follow through on. But protectionism, yes, anti-offshoring, the wrong thing for the world right now is for America to go into its shell and think that the solution is by building walls around it. Right. Yeah, Just, if there's a person in this room who doesn't know this, uh, Meg Whitman is one of the principal advisors to, about policy to Senator McCain, having said that. <laughs> well, I, I recognize that I am in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which could be not the most friendly crowd to the candidate I support. But um, I think that there's a couple of things. One is, you know what, I am um, tremendously proud of Barack Obama as well. As a woman in America, to see an African American, to see someone like Barack achieve the um, nomination of the Democratic Party makes me proud too. And so um, I think that is a great thing for America. 
But because I was trained at the Harvard Business School, I am first and foremost focused on how do we build a strong economy? Because I think every country's world power, everything is built on a strong economy. And I just happen to think that John McCain has a better plan for reinvigorating our economy, which will then allow us to reassert our leadership in the world. And if you think about what the priorities ought to be um, when the new president takes office, um, first and foremost is energy independence, number one, two, and three. Because there's a perfect storm here, a good perfect storm. One is, for the sake of the climate, we must get off fossil fuels. We can no longer continue to spend $700, spend $700 billion overseas to countries who don't like us very much, which also is hurting our economy so much. In other words, the high price of oil is driving the high price of food, which is driving all the, the issues that we talked about in the economy. So I would say number one is energy independence, because I think it solves three problems at once. Number two is what are we going to do about getting the national debt back down. What are we going to do to, one thing I learned at Harvard Business School, revenues need to be more than costs. <laughs> and this may come as a surprise. You don't have to come to Harvard Business School. <laughs> 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 and um, our ability to continue to spend beyond our means year after year after year has got to be brought under control. And that has to be about how do we tackle the existing cost structure of the federal deficit, a federal budget, and then how do we prioritize what we want to do as a country. And I am of the opinion that we are going to have to prioritize that we're not going to solve world hunger, health care, energy independence, um, every issue um, that is in front of us, we're going to have to prioritize. And I'm a big believer of setting them up and knocking them down. So how about we go after energy independence and education as our first two? And then when we get those nailed, we can go on to another, another number of, of issues. But um, all, it's all around economy, economics for me. And, and I think Anand would say that you know, free trade, small business growth, low taxes that um, spur entrepreneurship has historically been the recipe for economic growth. Yep. All right. Um, let me... Again, within the great uh, notion of leadership and the art of leadership, uh, in dealing with this crisis, you know, I would have wanted to see, and, and I don't know all the phone conversations that Secretary Paulson's had, or Ben Bernanke. My impression is that there are a lot of conversations, but I mean, how many of you have been invited to Washington to have some conversation about what's going on? People who, who have been leaders in their field. Uh, are you involved in any way in the conversation, in the decision making uh, about this? I mean, Jim? I think I'm the wrong side of the color party here, so I'm not invited. Yeah, no. right. Now, Jeff, I mean, do you, are you? Sure. Had, no, I've, I've had, you've had conversations with, with and yeah. Tim and people like that yeah. during it. Yeah. And, 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 and do you think in, that's anything missing from this? Uh, is one question. I mean, is any act that you see, anything that you have recommended? Uh, because people look at the bailout and they see now, for example, as one small point that, you know, Paul Krugman's got a column today uh, about Gordon Brown, how Gordon Brown is making the right choices now. And there's a, you know, most people believe Secretary Paulson, you know, is going to follow that model or has been thinking about it, even suggested it over the weekend. Anything missing here? Is anything that, uh, you know, Charlie, that look, ought I, to I, be done? And, and what's the lesson of the way this has been handled? It, it, you know, again, I think there's two broad problems that they're trying to address. You right. know, one is arrest the drop in housing prices. Right. The other one is to try to get fundamental uh, credit flowing between banks and break open the liquidity. Um, I think now looking back, sitting here on October 13th, looking back on the last eight weeks or year, all the way back to Bear Stearns and beyond, you could say, gosh, maybe there could have been a tapestry that you could put in place that would say, here's the, here's the framework that we're going to be addressing. We're going to do this, 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 this. I don't know, guys. I, if you had a year of your business career, right? And just bare sterns had happened, it would have been a lot. 
that. In other words, you'd look back and say, gosh, you remember 2008? Bear Stearns almost went back and said, holy shit, how'd that happen? Yeah. You know? Right. But, because now, now because you, you can look back and there was long-term capital and there was Kidder Peabody. Now you have Lehman Brothers and, and, on Monday, AIG on time. Tuesday, Break the Buck on Wednesday, hey. then the next weekend. Fannie Freddie. Yeah, Fannie Freddie. Exactly. Th this is a... Tsunami. This is un unspeakable, undreamt of, unprecedented, and, and, uh, and really bad, really tough. Okay? Now, what I like about what these guys have done is they've been willing to roll up their shirt sleeves, and they're, and they're every day they're in there with a new idea. They're willing, to, they're willing to change if that's required. And I, for one, just think Bernanke, Geithner, Paulson, these are three good yeah. guys. Right. And we are, we are lucky right. to have them. I agree with that. And, I just think sometimes I, I think we become numb to it, and and whether it's the whether it's the the media or just citizens have no concept for how many things have happened in the last six weeks. So Charlie, you know, again, yeah. no, what, I, less, what, lesson what lesson can we learn? What lesson can we learn? You know. Let's yeah. try never to do this again, okay? Just, right. as, a poor, as a poor little CEO, you know, once in a lifetime is plenty, you know? But, but I, I just think we've become numb to how much, how, how close we've come to system failure, how many yeah. things have happened to keep that from happening, mm -hmm. and, and I feel good we've got and people in place who are doing a pretty good job. You know, when I raise the question about America's decline with former presidents and, and all range of people around the world, they all say to me, in the end, notwithstanding the changes that are taking place in terms of a global economic question, the rest of us is, I mean, the rest of the world is coming up, as we all know, but, but more and more people say to me, don't bet against America, you know, in, or I've never lost money betting with America is one issue. The other thing that they, they <laughs> are saying is that, you know, we see now you know, a, a, sort of the best of America in terms of the country coming together, for the most part, uh, and recognizing that this is not a partisan solution. And you're seeing, I mean, we had an issue there at the Congress where the first uh, rescue plan didn't get through the House Congress, but the second one did, and and uh, that that is says something, and especially under the, the tireless energy of Hank Paulson, who. Um, and secondly, Ben Bernanke and Tim Geithner and others, those people who are working around the clock. It does say something about our system uh, that's very good. Jim, you were going to say. Yeah, I just wanted to say something about the speed with which this has come upon us. Right. In the third week in August, I had dinner at my house in Wyoming. There's a meeting always at the Minneapolis Fed, and I had, uh, I had there Ben Bernanke and Tim Geithner and uh, Right. A bunch of people I think you were going to come at one right. point. Right, I was. A and uh, the head of the European Central Bank. And this was en famille. This was not in front of other people. This was the family talking. Right. And there wasn't a hint of this, this level of crisis. Right. So I think one thing we have to understand is that both the international bankers at the middle of August, third week in August, we were a little worried about some of the things that were happening, but there was no sense at all of the scale of this thing. Uh, and I find that just remarkable. <laughs> mm. I, 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 it's where I started my comments. No one foresaw this at the, at the level and the rapidity of the evolving crisis that has happened over the past four weeks. And I think it's easy to second guess people when you're, in the, when you're not in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that anyone in this room, maybe there are who could have done or would have done a better job, but it is hard when you are in the maelstrom trying to make the decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. I think we have to actually give Ben Bernanke, Hank Paulson, and Tim Geithner a lot of credit because what they've had to deal with is unprecedented in history, unprecedented certainly in our lifetime. And I think they've done a good job of adjusting. They are constantly coming up with new ideas. And I do think we had an expression in the internet that John will relate to, which is the price of inaction is far greater than the cost of making a mistake. That's right. And I think that is so true here. The price of inaction, while we studied it and thought about it, I, could, I think could have led to the destabilization of the world economic system as we know it. And so maybe action number one wasn't perfect, but it was sure better than sitting there doing nothing. And the, and the batting average has been, been high probably overall. And people will argue as well whether 
uh, not saving Lehman Brothers did created of more course. problems, but then they came back with AIG. AIG, and, and, and uh, you know, they're evolving. First, we were going to buy all the toxic mortgages. We're still going to do some of that, but now we're going to invest liquidity into the banks. And the great thing about investing in these banks is they can then lever that investment on a 10 times basis to actually out go out and lend. And the, the, the liquidity, if we can unlock the credit crunch, if we can unlock the credit system, then as Jeff has said many times, this will actually begin to sort of grease the, the economy. Yeah. And so I think that this is smart. You know, you're adapting to the situation, you're adapting to other people's good ideas, other people's best demonstrated practice. And I think it shows flexibility of thought and um, seriousness of purpose that actually speaks really well about the United States. Uh, the, the similar thoughts that I'd had when we talked about not to act is to act, Right. you know. Um, so, John. Agreement right. for the leadership and the long hours that we've been putting in to try to solve this problem. We've got to get liquidity again in the markets. I'm bothered that I don't think anything we've done addresses what I believe to have been the root cause of this, which is our financial system have put homeowners in homes they can't afford under financial terms that they can't afford them more and more and more with uh, adjustable rate mortgages. And I'm not going to pay any of the principal forever and the equity value is dropping. And look, those people are going to walk away from those homes. We don't want those homeowners to walk away from those homes. And so the comprehensive plan, which maybe we're going to hear tomorrow, I believe is going to have to go out and say, those mortgages, we're going to get rid of the fancy, funny instruments. We're going to make them 30-year mortgages. You're going to have to pay down the principal, and we're going to value those homes at what they're really worth. And we can do a lot of work on the system, and we must. But until we reach out and change those fundamental terms, I don't think we'll have worked our way through this crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Much has been said about when you look at our current account deficit. And when you look at uh, where it is, this has to do especially in the amount of debt, you know, that we've been in this kind of mutually assured dependency. They needed our markets, we needed their, they needed their money, so they gave us the debt. Um, do you think anything coming out of this will change this notion that we are more of a consumption society than a saving society? James? Well, the truth is that we're bottom of the league table in terms of being a saving society. We spend more than we earn, and we do it every year. And it's increased in the last 10 years, as I said, significantly. So last year we spent 30% more than we earned. Uh, until we start saving and cutting back, uh, at which, uh, uh, and by the way, spending more than we earn leads to the buildup of debt. And so the things are totally interrelated. We now have 70% home ownership in our country, up from 64% in the last 10 years. But the number of homes that have been uh, without equity value in them is now 10% of the homes. So we have a lunatic situation where we kid ourselves by borrowing money, investing. Uh, the value of the homes is now less than the mortgages that we have. So you have this overhang, and I agree with John, if we could somehow rectify that. But we need a change in our culture, we need some leadership from the top which says, listen guys, let's go back to spending what you earn. And that's not easy, but we have to do that or we're finished as a society. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, what? I hate to only be looking this way. What comes out of this, and, and I, as we sort of come to the last 10 to 15 minutes of this conversation, what, what is the kind of a definition of leadership? And one seems to be a leader is, is able to define the problem, define the responsibility, define the accountability, but in addition to that, to be able to ask for sacrifice. Uh, and, and in a political environment, that's rarely heard. Yes? I think it's very difficult, but it's essential. I mean, there is no future for our country unless we stop spending more than we earn. It's very simple. <laughs> you can't have $10 trillion of debt building to $15 trillion of debt without ruining the dollar, ruining our country, ruining the interest in our country. And at the same time as the rest of the world is moving forward with greater balance. So I think the first thing that we have to think about is this, this issue of debt. I agree with Meg uh, in terms of priorities. The second is education. 
we have to make sure that we're educating our kids uh, to think about globally, to think about technologically and to take back the leadership that we once had. You know, you know, immigration was an issue during the primaries, but we haven't heard very much about it, you know, in terms of changing our immigration policy, not just about border crossing, but in terms of people who come here, you know, and might want to stay here, but they, they now have opportunity to go back to India, even, you know, but even if they wanted to stay. Uh, Charlie, the, uh, I, again, at the risk of sounding, um, terminally optimistic about America. I think people are not going to constantly go back simply because there's opportunity. Because what you've got here is an environment that encourages entrepreneurialism. That is open. That's why my fear about over-regulation and an overreaction to this crisis. But you asked us, you sent us a mail asking us about leadership right. for, the, uh, for the future. And I think the answer is actually staring us right in the face where we sit today. Well, not right here, and Jay, I hope you won't take back my achievement award for saying this, but I think the answer is across the river. I think the answer is what's across the river and what in the future will be around the business school when the business school becomes the epicenter and you switch to Alston. The real strength of America, funnily enough, is not its professional schools because the world is catching up. In India, we have the IITs, we have the ISBs. What we don't have in India and what the world really doesn't have and doesn't understand the importance of is the liberal arts. And when I asked my daughter yesterday, well, I've got this question, what do you think uh, it would take to make a leader? And she said, foresight, somebody's able to see the future in a sense. And she wasn't talking about Hindu astrology, she was just talking about somebody who's able to provide a picture. Now, everyone in a ship, you needed to have somebody on the top of the mast looking out, spotting the horizon or the storms. You can do that on a ship, but you have to have a virtual mind to be able to do that in business. And I think where you get trained to do that is in the liberal arts, is in people who are right-brained as well as left-brained. That is really what is needed. You, you have that answer here. Maybe I'm a little biased because I did go, I, I finished college across the river. And, um, <laughs> you know, but when I came here... How many years did you spend here? <laughs> Very happily, many, a lot of them. And, um, and this Achievement Award will make me come back again more and more. But the, uh, I majored in, in filmmaking across the river, in visual and environmental studies. So when I came here in my section, that made me good enough to you know, operate the camera during managerial communications. <laughs> and, uh, I, I was nicknamed Metro Goldwyn Mahindra. <laughs> But you know, that's all they used me for. And honestly, Jay, I think I could have been better used if there had been a respect for right brain people. I was probably the token guy you took in, let's get yeah. one weirdo into the class. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Otherwise, everybody was from McKinsey or from yeah. investment banking, and they needed a little variety. But I think there should be more recognition that you need right brain people, you need people who are creative, because they're going to be able to see out can, of that. Can I now house. connect this to the. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I agree. Let me ask you, because of the kind of wide experience you have had, uh, both in terms of consulting and then, and then taking a, a small company into a huge company, and, and now looking at horizons like perhaps becoming governor of California. Uh, if you look at that arc, tell me the kinds of things that, that have served you well or experiences you wish you had had in terms of exercising leadership. So I think, and I will speak personally, because I think there are different leadership styles. There's not, you know, the workbook that says one, two, three, four, right, here's right. how you do leadership. But I think it is individuals who can paint a vision of where the organization or the country or the not-for-profit want to go, to create a vision of where you're going to lead that organization. Then secondly, to prioritize the initiatives about how one is going to get to where you want to go and then line your organization up to deliver against those priorities. And I am a huge believer in building the right team. You know, I was the leader of eBay for 10 years, but I did not build eBay by myself. Um, I had a very talented team of executives who were handpicked for the right job at the right time um, in that exact right stage of growth. And by the way, the people that we hired in 1998 not all of them scaled to 2008, but I was very focused on the right person in the right job at the right time. 
And um, so I think it's vision, I think it's priorities, and I think it's the right people. And then it is holding people accountable for results. Um, I am surprised how often in government and how often in business people are not held accountable for results. And in the end, that is what makes the world turn around. That's what makes government great. It's what makes great companies. And I, I agree with Anand that um, there is a balance of right brain and left brain. We are an engineering-driven company. We are a technology-driven company. But the user interface, the understanding of consumers is fundamentally a right brain um, exercise. So, so I agree with that. So I think it's not that complicated. It's vision. It's people and its priorities. And how about acknowledgement? I mean, and I suggest you have done this in, in terms of reading. And I mean, you, you, when you look back at your experience, I mean, Japan is not a place uh, you have acknowledged that you right. wish you had done Japan differently. Right. Right. Uh, how about the uh, two things? One, and I want everybody to speak to this. One, the, the ability to communicate. Yep. Um, I mean, we've seen there's been no particular leader in this crisis we've gone through, you know, who could inspire the country, who was in a position of making decisions. Um, partly because they were so busy, but also partly because of communication skills. Where do you put acknowledgement of mistakes and B, ability to communicate? So the ability to communicate is incredibly important. It was not as important at eBay when we had 30 people because I could put them in a room about this right. big and we could have a conversation. But as you get a global organization like, like Jeff Leeds and Anon Leeds and, and others, communication is incredibly important because you have to have some sense that the marketing manager in Spain actually knows what it is you're trying to do collectively to further the goals of the business Absolutely. and frankly further the goals of the community of users. I also think fostering a culture of willingness of of the ability to make mistakes. And we had a point of view at eBay, which is that we made mistakes and we fixed them really fast. And you can't fix the mistakes unless you acknowledge the mistakes. And in many ways, this translation to the political arena has been hard in that regard because it's hard in politics for politicians to acknowledge mistakes. They don't want to acknowledge Because somebody's mistakes. ready to jump on it, too. Absolutely. Um, but this notion of acknowledging mistakes and fixing mistakes fast, I think, has actually been very helpful to me and very helpful to the company over the last 10 years. We'll come back to Anand, Anand because he got us started on this. Jeff, tell me leadership in terms of what you've learned and being a CEO that's not, that you didn't expect, that might have surprised you, and what has served you well in terms of being able to take GE through some difficult times. You know, Charlie, I, let me answer, but first, I wanted to back up a little bit just okay. in terms of um, your question on immigration and trade and things like that. I, I think we have a country right now that just isn't self-confident. And, and, and our position on immigration is more a manifestation of our lack of confidence right now than anything else that's cultural or anything like that. And, and I think what would be important for the next president is to let us solve one problem together. Let's pick energy. And let us have the confidence of solving one problem together and then I think we get some self-confidence again. You know, we create jobs, we get some momentum. And I think so much of any part of leadership is just confidence that, uh, you know, I, I think that's what's really important today. In terms of, uh, you know, you never get a job like, uh, like running GE because of what you know, you get it because of how fast you can learn. Yeah. And the events are totally unpredictable. I, I'd say the most, uh, the most surprising part of my job has just been how unpredictable, you know, think about what we've lived through over the last uh, decade, 9-11, you know, two recessions, financial meltdown, stuff like war. that. I mean, yeah. War. I mean, you know, things that you can't, um, can't uh, predict. So I, I'd say the four things I think about, particularly at a, at a high level, decisiveness. You, you've got to be willing to make decisions and you've got to be willing to make them sometimes without perfect knowledge. Make said accountability, accountability. You, you've got to be willing to stand up, stand by your decisions, admit when you made a mistake, but make sure that you and your team are always accountable. Transparency. We, we, we just live in a society today where it's not enough just to tell the truth, you have to show the intent behind your actions and be willing to just let it all out there and, and, and let it be. And the last one I think is important is uh, unity. It, it, people want to be a part of something that lasts. And, and the value I have about GE is it's not really just about today in my company. It's about the future. And, and, and people know that this is a great company that's going to be around for a long time and they want to be a part of that. Uh, the last thing I'd say about leadership Charlie, is that in some ways it's an intense journey into yourself. It's about 
how much you want to learn. It's about how much you want to give. It's about personal change and, and, and just being willing to kind of renew yourself almost every day. You know, I, I take every criticism personally and I go to bed at night and, you know, gosh, I'm saying, gosh, I'm such a failure. Yes. And I get up the next morning and say, you know, hello, handsome. Let's go, <laughs> <laughs> Let's go get him, you know? And, and you've got to be able to renew yourself. You've got to be able to renew yourself and go, and go <laughs> fight the battle again, you know? John, if, I you stand, if I stand up in front of 320,000 people and say, oh, God, you know what we're going <laughs> to I don't know. I just don't know what we're going to do today, you know? <laughs> You stand up and say, we got it nailed. <laughs> this is our best day. Let me tell you why, you know? And, that's, and so I just think this process of renewal and being willing to put up with it all right. and, yet, and yet keep this reservoir of confidence is extremely important to lead any organization. John, you get up every morning saying, hello, handsome. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I worship entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs do, I like to define it this way, more than anyone thinks possible with less than anyone thinks possible. It's really remarkable. That, and I'm, uh, I'm an idea junkie, and so innovation is really very important. We've all witnessed this and been part of it and benefited from us in our lives. So what I like to say about, notwithstanding all that, what I like to say about leadership is that, relatively speaking, Ideas are easy. To the points about accountability, it's execution that's everything. Execution is everything, it's all that matters. And the way you get there is through a team. Ideas are easy, execution is everything, and it's teams that win. Now this goes full circle to communication because uh, as my daughters who are here know, uh, when I get up in the morning, what, what I'll say to them is, Mary and Esther, your ability to be leaders is gonna turn on your ability to think on your feet and communicate effectively, which is why communication is so important. That's how Meg, that's how Jeff, that's how we all inspire a team. So uh, that plus one other ingredient I think make for outstanding leaders. And, and that last one is character. You know it when you see it. It, it, it's integrity, and great leaders have that character, and the people they communicate to know it. Uh, someone uh, once said to me, uh, John, integrity is a binary state. Either you have it or you don't. It's like holding uh, your integrity in your hands, grains of sand, and if you ever once spread your fingers apart, it's gone forever. Thank you, John. <laughs> I, uh... I, I, I couldn't possibly add to those three remarkable statements about corporate leadership, except one footnote, which is that I think we have to spend more time thinking about the environment in which we're operating, not just the physical environment, but the global environment. And I'm afraid that the leadership is not being given at a political level in terms of the fact that we have close to 200 countries, we got 53 of them in Africa, we have a total movement in terms of a world which is not being managed in any effective way. Uh, the UN is not working. The international institutions in terms of development are not working. They're proliferating. And it is just my hope that as some small part of business leadership, there could also be a contribution by business leaders to try and stimulate the politicians and the political, leader, the political leaders in our countries to try and think about this environment, not just the physical environment, which John is talking about, but the global environment, which is changing around us in such a dramatic way and where the best talent is not going. So there is a need, I think, if business is going to succeed, to recognize that influencing that environment in which we're operating is going to be a central part of success. Uh, let me close this by saying uh, several things. First of all, um, uh, thank you for being attentive and fun and engaged and, and uh, your, your response suggests uh, that what they were saying were resonating. I wish somehow that, that this conversation actually could have been heard 
uh, across the country, uh, listening to people who reflected, you know, confidence in the country and self and respect for people, yet at the same time uh, laying out the challenges for the future and, and what all of us must do, and especially those uh, who want to lead us. Um, finally, I think that this says to me and people who do what I do, uh, that it is required of us to be leaders, too, in terms of asking the right questions and the most important questions, uh, and questions that, that require some sense of, of preparation, some sense of, of reaching out and asking uh, people what it is, um, ourselves, the best we can, you know, what are those issues that are defining us, both in terms of the human condition and in terms of the country that we live in, and increasingly the globe that we are all together in. Certainly questions of environment and global health uh, and, and understanding that on great geopolitical questions uh, there is a crying need for dependence and sharing, never more apparent than it is in this economic crisis we go through. Finally, and I say this with great humility, uh, I could not uh, have been served by a better panel. So join me in thanking Meg, Anand, Jeff, John, Jim. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Anand, thank, thank you. Thank you, dear. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Charlie, Charlie, as the chairman of the uh, Centennial Business Summit, I had very, very high hopes for this session. You vastly exceeded it. You basically <laughs> set the tone that we wanted. I understand, again, as I listened to our five award winners, you know, why I have always stayed a member at the faculty of the Harvard Business School. <laughs> this is, in fact, the very best of what we have. In the audience here are 100 members from the current student body. We hope 30 years from now, you also will be up here. This is what we are all about. And I want to thank you, May, thank you very much. Anand, Jeff, John, and Jim. Truly extraordinary. <laughs>